so uh, welcome uh, to uh, this this final session of the uh, of the, the very parallel uh, discussions that we are having. Uh, I'm having discussion here with my good friend uh, David uh, about uh, well, we have an official title: Are there physical facts or only interpretations? Uh, that sounds uh, a very kind of post uh, postmodern view on science. Right, but well, we're going to take the pre-modernist point of view. So you are all here uh, in the pre-modernist. Uh, David, I want to start by, uh, oh, you time. talked this morning about the scientific method, the various elements in the scientific method, uh, observations, experiments, theory. Uh, one of my favorite cartoons has two scientists, there's a very complicated lab, and they say, oh, uh, very well, colleague, this all works, uh, 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 does it also work in theory? <laughs> and uh, uh, because I want to, in the end, you say nature is the final arbiter of truth, but it's also something about the nature of truth. Now, what? How do we describe it? And what's the role of theory? And um, so, c can you perhaps you know, say a few things about? Uh, <coughs> what it means to be a theorist, because I think up to now a lot of the discussions about facts, which are just the right. data points, but we do much more than just data points. You know, we draw a curve through well, the data the points. Well, the goal in the end of science is to understand. To understand, exactly. Well, two things, to understand, to satisfy our curiosity, to know how and, and sometimes why it works. But the other thing, of course, is to control. Yes. We, I mean, I think ever, from an evolutionary point of view, scientific method, after many faulty turns, that was discovered and you know, so effective that it evolved rapidly because it enabled uh, humans, homo sapiens, to control better and better the, the physical world and you know, destroy other species, for example, and change the earth and, not, and kill other humans yes. and so on. So, there are two goals, understanding and controlling. But, and for the scientists, understanding is so important, of course. That's but this understanding, this understanding is sometimes a painful process. So for instance, oh, if you yeah. look in our field, uh, particle physics, yes. you know, think about, say, quantum mechanics. You know, we now celebrate as a great success. But it was a kind of painful delivery. And in some sense, it also led to the loss of certain things. For instance, the fact that we couldn't perhaps predict or understand certain things that we wanted for, to do. Indeed, for some people, it's still very painful. Yes. Personally, <laughs> I don't find it painful at all. <laughs> but, you know, some of my great heroes, like Einstein, was tortured by the change of worldview that quantum mechanics uh, required and could never accept it. Um, I mean, the fact that it's only probabilistic statements and, and you don't have this... Yeah, precise it's, image of how things well, work. Well, as you know, it's a little more complicated than that. And, and in some sense, um, the quantum world is totally deterministic. Yes. We have a deterministic equation for, for the evolution of states in the Hilbert space. However, in order to discuss uh, measurements and um, how, we, how we make contact with um, the observable world, we um, are forced to introduce statistical um, statements. Yes. It's a change of point of view. Still one that 90 years later, quantum mechanics is still very young. Uh, I don't think we fully, deeply understand mm -hmm. uh, in a way that will probably take another few hundred years. Deep concepts in physics take a long time to assemble, to, to truly uh, grasp. So, indeed, being forced to change one's fundamental concept is very difficult. It's difficult in politics, it's difficult in family life. It's, it's very hard to change one's point of view. Yes. We all know that. Change one's point of view about some of the basic concepts of our picture of the world which we acquire as infants. Exactly. So I think we're actually now, uh, today, in modern physics, going through a period which might last another century of try uh, coming to grasp with the quantum nature of space and time, our most basic physical concept. Right. And we're trying to modify that. We're being forced 
by our um, attempts to to go beyond our present theory and to confront some of the mysteries of gravity and quantum mechanics, I believe, to change our basic concepts of space and time. That is a very difficult process. It is currently painful, yeah. especially since we don't know the answer yet. Exactly. So just talk about also this, I mean, one thing that we of course try to do is to uh, you know, discover more truth, you know, expand our understanding. Yeah. You mentioned this morning a few of the kind of fundamental questions about you know, how did the universe come into being, uh, a question about what is the true nature of space and time. Yes. These are questions that, you know, previously wouldn't even be considered questions. Uh, well, I like to say that, you know, uh, in the past, well, questions like that, we were simply, we didn't know enough to be ignorant. Of yes. It. We didn't know enough to be able to formulate questions my favorite in a scientific way. My favorite example, you know, if you would go back a hundred years, yeah. uh, any any pr question about anything around us, you know, why is glass transparent, you know, why have things the colors they have, why does the sun shine, questions that a, a young child will ask, Yes. they were all basically unanswerable, right? Because we right. didn't have atoms, we didn't have molecules, you know, we, we couldn't calculate any of the properties of any material around us. Right. And it's interesting, in fact, when you go back to uh, scientific literature of a century ago or more, most scientists didn't ask those questions. No. Because they sort of knew, you know, they didn't know how to approach those questions. They were yet just so stories. They weren't yet scientific questions. Yes. So, uh, but the realm of what is scientific questions has grown enormously, many of which we answered, like, what is life? Yes. I mean, yes. that's amazing. Yeah. We now know what life is. We're not exactly sure how it began on Earth, but we know what it is. Or the origins of, you know, the the... the Cosmological irregularities, I would say. You know, that's you the formation of structure in the yes, universe. It's, yes. it's totally. Science is remarkable. Um, so, can we briefly talk about what is kind of the the compass that guides us into this kind of uh, ocean of ignorance? You no. Know? Uh, so yes. again, you know, some for some theorists, it's uh, it's mathematical beauty. I mean, it's the cons what's the role of mathematics in your point of view? Well, I regard mathematics much like language and logic. Yes. It's the same, you know, it's simply the mental tools we have acquired, evolutionary, to, to comprehend the real world. Um, they're kind of basic. It's yes. hard to change logic. Nobody very much, except some of our crazier colleagues, have imagined different universes with different logic yes. or mathematics. Yes. So they're tools. Um, but... We have, but they are tools that I believe developed because we are trying to control the natural world. Some people find it surprising that they work so well in yes. describing the natural world. I don't because we developed those tools to describe the natural world. No, but is but, it is know, it obvious? It would be weird if they didn't work. Is it obvious that uh, you know uh, one thing that you know you uh, and, and Frank and, and others here are, are really architects of uh, the standard model of particle physics, which uh, amazingly powerful theory it's i find it extremely elegant yes you no know, it can fit even the mathematical equations can fit on one line was there er any guarantee you know, clearly you say well it's obvious that mathematics in some sense describes the world that it is in some sense if so simple well you know i i I'm, if you try to analyze what do you mean by mathematical beauty yes so you know if i uh, write down the equations of quantum chromodynamics uh uh, I find them beautiful. You find them beautiful. Frank finds them beautiful. I'm but not sure. It's an acquired though. taste. It's an acquired it taste, right? Definitely, it's an acquired taste. But yes. it's more than that. What do we mean by beauty yes. in mathematics? Uh, this kind of elegance that you're referring to. I think it. If, you know, my impression when a ma when a mathematician says that an equation is beautiful, I I think to some extent what he, they really mean by that is the power is that it's powerful. Yes. Yes. So beauty. Uh, first approximation, at least mathematically, is, is equal to power. And that's sort of what we mean in physics as well. I mean, one of the amazing facts that, uh, you know, we, our discovery led to was this theory, which was unbelievably powerful. Uh, you know, we now can... An infinite number of predictions out of well, essentially... Uh, 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 no, but more equation. than that, you know, just the power of a simply formulated set yeah. of equations and concepts with this enormous applicability. And uh, that's, 
and to some extent what we mean by beauty. But um, I'm not, it's not really surprising if, if science, well, it, again, I don't find it totally surprising that the world is comprehensible. Mm. I would find it pretty bizarre if it wasn't. Yes. What would that mean? Yes. Uh, so it's not too surprising, but, it, but I do admit that it's just absolutely wonderful and gorgeous. <laughs> well, it's perhaps not surprising that it's in s at some level uh, comprehensible, but isn't it kind of uh, surprising that uh, for us human beings who are, you know, we have a limited brain, it wasn't evolved to understand quantum chromodynamics, it was evolved to uh, survive uh, in the jungle or something, and we are able to do this anyhow. Right. It, it is kind of amazing. Uh, we are somewhat of a primitive species which uh, our politicians are, are exhibiting, yes? Yes. Uh, what we have going for us is the thing you started out with, with was mathematics and language. So what yes. differentiates us from those, from our cousins whom we're busily exterminating, uh, is the facility of language, mm. whose most advanced form is mathematics. Yes. And that is a powerful tool with somewhat of an infinite capacity. A newborn infant can yes. utter sentences that no one has ever uttered right. before. So we have a kind of an enormously powerful tool. Well, one thing we have seen is we said, you know, the, the, if you, the story of science is also very much a story of transition, where we somehow move to a, a next level. Mm -hmm. I, I think Feynman somewhat surprised it very nicely that he said, you know, well, everything fits, and then certainly something doesn't fit, and you think, oh, wait a moment, this is a crisis, and then by somehow going to the next level, prob right. probably sometimes also by losing some, you, you gain new insights and it becomes beautiful again. In the way like quantum theory is beautiful, but it's at I a different level as classical I, I, mechanics. I, I still don't agree with you that we lose something. Yeah. We lose something that was incorrect or the yeah. wrong way of... So it's a good thing to lose. Yeah, it's a good thing to lose yes. because it really wasn't, didn't work so yes. well. So it's not a bad idea to lose b bad ideas. But... Um, yeah, it, there might we might run out of the ability to do this. Who knows? We're trying to, you know, we now phrase and can write scientific papers and get them published in good journals about the beginning of the universe. Yes. Uh, that's looks like a pretty hard question to solve. Uh, I'm not. Sh I I hope there are good answers in my lifetime. I kind of doubt it, but. It is a scientific question now. Are we smart enough to answer such a question? I'm not, I, I have faith that we are, and if not, we'll start modifying yes. or having intercourse with machines or who knows what. Uh, can I just uh, p point to that point? Uh, I mean, in some sense, uh, you know, the big, uh, big story these days is now machines getting smarter. Uh, you know, some, some are even, many fields of science, you know, where they are confronted with massive amount of data. We have machines making sense of it. You think if that will be at some point part of our effort to find the truth, will be you'll be interviewed here or I, I, by a machine? I do think we will I evolve to have a very interesting relationship with machines in, in one way or another. But I think at the moment, the, uh, the all this uh, uh, discussion about deep learning and so on is a lot of hype. Mm -hmm. It really is enormously exaggerated, and those um, those um, uh, neural networks that uh, have have done quite a bit, you know, are able to play Go and Jess are are not very interesting, in my opinion, mm -hmm. and w are very unlikely to discover anything interesting. One thing I worry about is is that it's all about uh, training machines to understand data and patterns. So they're very good kind of understanding yeah. a certain fixed universe of phenomena. But right. I think the human mind has this wonderful uh, ability to jump out of it. Well, and we have no idea kind of what, questions. what the human mind is or how it works. Yeah. The weirdest thing is that these machines or neural networks uh, that learn how to play Go better than Go masters, uh, the people who uh, construct them and they're sitting there before, right, you know, right there and you can measure every uh, component and how it's connected to every other component of those neural networks. 
people have absolutely no idea how it works either. Yes. So yes. we don't understand even how the machine works, much less the human brain. Um, I'm just very not impressed by the accomplishment so far, and and <laughs> not to speak of the things they can't do. Right. Which are Can I move to some some completely different subject? So so you talked about you know th this morning basically equating truth with a scientific method, and so if we talk about you know spreading in some sense not the perhaps the facts of science but the methods of science. So I want okay. to share a little anecdote. I was on television and uh, showing little experiments that you can do with children. So mm -hmm. I had a little balloon filled with water, you can do it at home and you try to, with a lighter, try to burn a hole in it and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So you can do the experiment, I should have done it here. <laughs> and it's, uh, it adds a little drama and then you can explain a little bit why this happens because it has to do with the heat capacity of water. So I had a nice little spiel there and the next morning I got an email from a very famous Dutch scientist. And he said, well, I loved your presentation, but your explanation was totally wrong. You didn't show the experiment to explain anything about heat capacity and thermodynamics. You did the experiment because you showed that you can trust science. There was a law of nature that prevented this magic trick from going wrong. Mm -hmm. So this is really about, can we in some sense explain the scientific method? Because I feel there's really a tension by uh, explaining the latest results in science, which might be very complicated, only few experts will understand it. But as you said, you know, the scientific method is much more. It's mm -hmm. a way to understand right. the world. It's something you can apply in various walks of life. Right. So how can we kind of teach the method in, instead of just focusing on the results? It's a wonderful question, and I certainly don't have the answer. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little... Um, Distraught by the fact that, you know, we have improved edu mass education yes. in this last century. Uh, you know, a century ago, very few people received anything beyond elementary education. Now, most of our citizens, in the United States, Europe, yes. advanced countries, finish high school. And yet, scientific ignorance, innumeracy, and superstition, astrology, the belief, at least especially in the United States, belief in creationism yes. continues even with half the... And perhaps yeah, we could argue that uh, where say 50 years ago or 100 years ago, it was easier for scientists to advise politicians and policy makers. Probably, you know, they, were, they had a more direct communication mm -hmm. uh, than nowadays. Yes. So Nowadays, uh, I think it was more immediate. Nowadays, it's all magic. So, ev or, you know, everyone uses these devices, but uh, number one, no, I mean, I'm sure 99%, including me, basically, I mean, <laughs> have no idea how this is made yes. or couldn't fix it. We used but to be able to fix the radio, you know. They couldn't that be a, this, this is, could be a dystopia that I worry about, yes. which I would say that on the one hand, you know, science progresses, it becomes very complicated. You have no idea how your iPhone works. Yes. You have no idea how the medicine works that you're taking. You have no idea how the, the machine that's controlling your right. life works. And on the other hand, so you're totally ignorant. On the other hand, you're totally controlled by it. Yes. So that could be, in, in some sense, we are we de we deploring here the way the public and politicians right. appreciate facts. But right. science is progressing, technology is not slowing down, and we are really in the grip of it. Right, it's very, it's contradictory. But we certainly are losing this direct touch with, as you call experiment, you yes. know, tactile connection that people used to have with chemistry sets and, mm. and fixing the radio or the car. You can't even fix a car anymore. Yes. But, uh, and, and so what happens is that people of the, uh, who might be attracted to science or interested in how things work now go onto the computer and, and get seduced by yes. a digital world that is unreal. I, uh, uh, I mean, I saw sense. the other day a, a, a kind of a computer program that was used for children to learn about mechanics. <laughs> so you could put right. like your hat, your two weights, and then the computer simulation showed how they, I think, wait a moment, you, you can program any law of nature. You actually should do the physical experiment exactly. and see it with your own eyes. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how you ever develop physics. I mean, as you know, as f theoretical physicists, 
we were all required to take an experimental lab. That was really painful. Yeah, it was painful, but boy, was it important to yes. actually feel yes. how things work. And, um, but David, there's a, there is a kind of a glass half full theory here that you know what happened with uh, uh, the spreading of education or something that uh, you know people might have turned into somebody called it like proto scientists. So you, you, you talked about the natural skepticism uh, again. There's this phrase you know belief in the the ignorance of experts yes, that we have an Feynman. open mind. Feynman's famous phrase uh, that people are they taking some of these approaches. For instance, you know, the, the, the proof by intimidation. Like mm -hmm. a hundred years ago, if you were a professor, mm -hmm. you would declare something and everybody would, you know, would believe it because you were the professor. These days... Still true in some countries. In some countries, still true. But it's probably that's a losing fight. I, I think but we these days will never come back. But mm -hmm. So in some sense that people have at least a kernel of a scientific or skeptical attitude, is that something that we could work with? Uh, we, we encourage that on the one hand, yes. and, and the other hand, we also like to exert scientific authority. Sci science, uh, I mean, I, I mentioned in my talk that there's no authority except nature. Yeah. It's not completely true, <laughs> since my fear, you know, there, around this world of science, there's a vast world of pseudoscience. Yes. And we, we have all sorts of institutional protections that separate science yes. from pseudoscience. Um, and, and they work pretty well and do require a certain amount of authority. But it's authority that can always be questioned. And yes. So. So, so one thing that you know, I worry about is that you know, we have this enormous growth of the scientific edifice, you know, the architecture. Yeah. We have really the number of scientists is growing incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. The number of collaborations is growing very fast. Yeah. There's a lot of policing going on, yes. but you know, a little bit reflecting on the earlier discussion, an infection at one place could easily spread, right? Isn't that something you worry about? That uh, you know, if there's some major disaster uh, in the scientific world, that people start doubting all of science? <laughs> we have strong, um, we have strong, a strong immunological system that we've constructed yes. so far protects us from pseudoscience, by and large. Uh, it's a very interesting too, idea. Yeah. I'm not sure. But, uh, yeah, it, I suppose it could happen. Progress, if you look, human history, uh, or recent human history of the last 10,000 years, definitely shows us that progress is not always positive. Yes. Um, we should remember that in the mm. days of Trump. Yeah. There, were, there was this period from the end of the Roman Empire for a thousand years of the Middle Ages, yes. where indeed we lost our understanding of science, of scientific method of mathematics. Yes. And if it weren't for those monks in Ireland, a lot of the or literature... Or the Islamic you know. culture, which, uh, I mean, yes. one thing you said, uh, I want just to finish, we were getting to the end. You, know, you, you ended your, uh, with a kind of a, a slide that was saying, we'll, we'll, we, we will we'll win in the end, so Churchill in uh, power. Right. But uh, part of that, I think, has been, uh, which is terrific, I think, you know, that we have this kind of global system. He said science is, in fact, universal. It's very hard to imagine any topic we can talk about if we aliens land here. Furthermore, we science. now, very importantly, we, unlike the beginning of the Middle Ages, we have a single language of science. Yes. yes. And luckily, it's not Dutch. Yes. But English. <laughs> 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 actually, in the 17th century, there was one well, the <laughs> Dutch scientist, Dave Winder, thought that actually Dutch was the language spoken in paradise. <laughs> I will explain to you in a moment why. <laughs> That's why he felt compelled to uh, have Dutch words well, for all the scientific concepts. It required concepts. gods to pronounce it correctly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but so let's finally uh, talk about this this element that, you know, we we are an international community. And I think that's yeah. something very, very rare. Right. I mean, I don't think we have any, had anything before where there's a culture that's, you know, Absolutely. spread around. It, I think it has a universal language. It might have been English. You might also argue it's mathematics. Um, and that creates some kind of stability. A shared culture, a shared language. And, you know, I often think, uh, if somebody were to ask me like this, you're a person from Mars landing on yes. Earth, and say, 
which country are you a citizen of? I would say I am a citizen of science. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. Uh, I want to uh, end. I know we're over time. One last question. Okay, I'm giving you a magic wand. Hmm. And uh, there's one fact, one element that everybody in the world will understand after you wave your <laughs> magic wand. What will it be? You mean after QCD? After uh, QCD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would you pick? Um, uh, I, I hate this kind of question. Let me give you my favorite one. Okay. The scientific method. Well, good. Great. Okay. I agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well done.